The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today, we're going to chat with a lovely woman who has had a great career and an interesting backstory in relation to how she's got into um, financial planning and indeed now runs a successful business in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, and without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Angie Menendez to the engine room. Welcome. Hi, Rox. Thanks for having me. And look, when we were chatting earlier off, off uh, camera, um, off camera, we've got no cameras. We, we should get cameras <laughs> here in the sound guy. So when we were chatting earlier, um, you did a bit of homework and I was super impressed. And so everyone who's been on this podcast, please be noted that Angie has actually got a, an eye for detail and I'm sure that's going to come out in this podcast. But the part of the detail that was probably the least prepared was your own personal backstory. So what I'd love to sort of tell our listeners is how you've come to being the general manager of CBD Advisory um, in Sydney and um, um, why are you going to stay? <laughs> So, uh, this is a special year for us, actually, Rox. So, it, it marks 30 years since incorporation of CBD advisory. So, the business uh, commenced in 1993 by our principal, Terry Panagiris. He had been working in financial services and then embarked in his own business in 1993. Uh, where I come into that equation, so uh, Terry is also my father. And um, I would say that. Uh, sort of having a financial services or uh, investment and building a protecting growth mindset was pretty much ingrained in my psyche from quite young. So You must have been almost at primary school or even earlier <laughs> when your dad, what was he doing before that? What was, uh, as in what, what was he his was occupation in, before that? Uh, I think he's well, as far as my memory can go in in my um, in my years. He's always been in financial services. Well, that's a lot. So he worked in different banks um, and in both managerial roles as well as financial advice. And then when he did embark on his own financial advice journey, that's when he moved into his own practice. And, and so, so you were getting used around the dinner table, right? Oh that yeah, it's just it? that whole understanding and the importance of investing um, and and obviously also protecting your asset base and learning the importance of financial independence and understanding financial concepts. So it almost felt like a natural transition to me to go and study further in university and come out, you know, with entering the financial services industry. So I entered um, into the corporate world and um, dabbled in a few different banks and then Felt that it was naturally the time to sort of move into the the family business. Uh, well, and that sort of- would have been that wouldn't have been so. That can be sort of a double edged sword. Yeah. So so uh, at, so you you worked for a couple of the banks, which um gave you a bit of a broad view of what's good and what's what's what you want to do and what what you don't want to do. Um. So at which which Christmas gathering <laughs> was the was the decision made? Well, it, it came to a point where uh, running at that time a, a sole practitioner practice, so to speak. So Terry had a CSO. He wanted someone that was able to do a bit more of the heavy lifting in terms of research and power planning support. 
Um, and as the industry, obviously, as everyone would know, is continuously evolving, it was coming to that point where, you know, you've, you've had some experience. Would you like to come in now and and invest in, in, in where we're going and our future trajectory? Now, obviously, being quite still early into the industry myself, I sort of started the ground roots still because I was a power planner or more of a, an, a support role in my previous um, positions. So came in more doing the power planning and research of our business. But I uh, noticed a few years in that I always had my ear to the ground with what was happening, sort of understanding where the industry was moving. So when it came to, you know, changing a fee structure, for example, or moving away from the commission structure in the, you know, earlier to half of the 2000s, sort of being that catalyst of change in a sole protection of business was something that I really had a passion to do. And, um, you know, so Terry was always loved to work in the business. And I found that just naturally I leaned more to working on the business and trying to learn quite quickly about the changes that were were evolving. So um, it, it almost felt quite naturally that I thought, no, this is what I'm passionate about and I really want to come in, get the power planning understanding, work my way up with understanding the research and how you put you know, a statement of advice together, for example. Was it called a statement of advice? Oh, it was back then, yeah. It was, okay, okay. It was a statement of advice. So what year was what year was it that you made the decision to to um to come in and amplify this business? In retrospect, you can say that. Oh, I can say it in retrospect. At the time it was obviously really trying to understand and and take it all in. Uh, but I entered the business in two thousand and seven. Right. Okay. So um like quite a few people who've come on this podcast, I've got to ask, so you've come in, in two thousand and seven and pretty well Yourself and Terry could throw a dart at the wall in 2007 and get an equity return. And then the GFC happened. Mm -hmm. So um, did that accelerate you growing up in relation to the clients or how, how did that impact your business? I think it definitely made me a better advisor having gone through that part of the journey, um, understanding myself, seeing you know, my own investments and the impact that that had and really understanding how to decipher a risk and the concepts of that, and like you said yourself, you know, throw a dart at the wall, and it was able to to have that performance and understanding that that wasn't always the case. And when you're young and you're in the industry, that's something as a very very hard concept to at first sort of be hit with and go, okay, this is something that I have to personally work through as well as deal with um, my own experience entering as a financial advisor. So I entered as an advisor in 2009. Prior to that, I was all doing a lot of the research to support what the advisors were doing. But still having that experience and even on my own investments um, did shape the way that I advise. So the GFC did have that that impact on me. And I think people had had very much um, in the early 2000s, they defined their success at being a financial planner in relation to the returns that they got. Yeah. And this was a great sort of come to Jesus moment as far as um, it really reset people and I think that even though we talk about, you know, for, for coming in in 2012 being a catalyst, mm. I genuinely believe that people were restructuring the value proposition towards advice and strategy, you know, post GFC almost certainly. immediately. Most certainly. Definitely changed the way. Um, I guess when I embarked on 2009, having having had that experience, uh, your value-based, goals-based advice was most certainly something that we looked at more as a core focus of how we deliver the advice to clients. So this was 2012. You moved off commissions as a predominant source of income um, and onto ongoing fee arrangements. Is that right? Correct, yes. And um, uh, what was your role in, in – so you structured up the pricing, for instance, as well as the, the ongoing? Uh, it was more about transitioning the client's – away from being on a commission structure yep. to a percentage-based fee under an ongoing fee arrangement. And throughout this, I mean, I've known you for a couple of years and it sounds, you know, if you if, if you fast forward to 2023, you know, it sounds like you've done that, you've taken on a bunch of ARs, you've got a successful business, but you did take a little bit of time to build yourself a little bit of a portfolio of children at the same yeah. time. So, <laughs> so how has it been? How has it been? And, and from every time I've, I've I've met you, you've always been completely and utterly focused and whatnot. But how have you managed to to juggle that? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, from my own story, uh, being an advisor up until uh, 2021, it was all things for the client. Very much focused on my primary role as trying to be the best financial advisor I could be. 
And then having upon embarking on becoming um, a mother, and I've, I've got three children under the age of six, so it's, it can be challenging at times. I noticed that naturally my role did lean away from being all things. So I was managing the business as well as advising staff. And you realize that I wanted work-life balance as well, and I couldn't be all things. So the it almost led me to the point where, okay, I need to manage and have other people come into this business as financial planners, which really was that that catalyst for letting go of control, letting go of that and allowing you know new talent to come into the business and then learning how to sort of cultivate the environment that would allow them to thrive. So really going into that management role. So I'm able to do that now as my core focus uh, and have uh, being a you know as very supportive and active mum, uh, as well as overseeing the business. And it's it's a real paradox that in order to, um, you know, as a, as a new parent, and I, I I raised three children with my lovely wife at whilst I was doing financial planning business as well, but you almost had to get a bigger, more complex business in order to be able to buy yourself time. That's right. Yeah. It's it's it's, yeah. it's, it's if you say that quickly, it it, it sounds mad. Yeah. Um, and, and I see that a fair bit. And the question that I've started asking um, uh, guests on the podcast um, who have young children and maybe, so your oldest is six, is that right? Yes. Okay. If I was to ask your child what you did for a living, what mum does for a living, what would they say? Um, mummy, mummy goes to work and is a likes to be a boss or something like that. <laughs> like that's, that's really what they would say is that mummy, mummy goes and, and and takes care of people at work. T- takes care of people. Takes at work. care of people at work. Yeah, know what that's yeah. saying. No, it's just something that I've just introduced, and I, yeah. I, I, I do like doing it. And I thought, well, and and has there been? Um, so you've been you, you throughout your career, you've worked in some banks, and then you've worked here, and you've had different licensing. Has there been anyone in particular who stood out in your career that's assisted you, or any organisation, or even if they've been suppliers to your business? Yeah, I've been fortunate in in my career this far to have some great support. Um, I would say that uh, through. Theo Christopoulos, uh, who's with ASVW Financial Services, which is our licensee, he's been almost like a mentor through my journey a lot. Um, you know, I'm able to just openly discuss with him wherever I think that our business is is going in its direction, and he's always been a wealth of knowledge. Um, we do have a great licensee, which have been very supportive. I almost feel like we're business partners in many ways, so that's great. Um, and I also uh, lean on a lot of uh, external coaches to assist in, in my own business. So I use uh, Real Business Matters um, and they've been a great support and I'm part of the Leadership Think Tank, which is a great round table where you openly discuss with like-minded individuals about different uh, business issues and uh, they just give you that open and broader perspective on things. And look, um, Kieran, I think we've got a few more links to add there. Um, we, we'll, we'll include those links um, just for people because it's, it's, you know, the whole ethos of of Ensemble is the positive evolution of advice, and and you know if you look at it through one lens, it's 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 sharing sharing stories and sharing um, kind of assets and experiences that makes our industry just better. So thank you very much for that. And I suppose why I'm why I'm um, sort of chatting about your business. Let's get right into it. Let's roll the collective sleeves up and let's try and paint the picture for the way in which the business is now in 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 2023 and 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 beyond. And um, so, yeah, maybe give me a bit of a feel for the Scaly business. How many advisors do you have, for instance? How many cut client service managers or whatever the terminology is? I mean, give us a feel of the org chart and potentially whether you, you, which way you've arranged them. You know, that's always quite mm. topical. So we're a team of 10. We have uh, four advisors uh, and it's life stage advice, so to speak. So we've got a principal advisor, a high net wealth advisor, uh, and mass affluent advices. Uh, we have a pod system. So we've got uh, client service officers that sit and assist uh, each pod and we have an office manager. And um, when when you say a pod system, um, given that the genesis of the business was 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 Terry than yourself, have you have you allocated the clients that, that you've taken on or is there a is there a real drive for your new advisors to build their own networks? What, what's what's kind of are they are they farmers? Are they hunters? Are they a combination? It's there. Yeah, it, they're a combination of both. So we really do embrace that autonomy with our advisors and try to empower them to run their own sub businesses within the greater business. Ooh. 
So they, they do have that um, autonomy to not only service a wonderful group of clients, but have that, that room for growth. Well, I can't wait to get into the, the, the business within a business because uh, you know, I'm passionate about that. But maybe just uh, taking a step back, what are the type of clients that, I mean, you're in um, uh, head offices in Bondi Junction, the eastern suburbs, fundamentally one of the more wealthier places in this country. What's the type of clients that you, you currently have and what's your aspirational direction for the type of clients? Yeah, so given that we, we somewhat have life stage advisors, so we've got our principal who's really passionate and addresses a lot of the pre and post retiree client base. And that's also given that the 30 years in business sort of naturally lean towards that that preference or that strength-based. Uh, we've also got the wealth accumulator phase um, and a lot of that's got to do with um, our relations with centres of influence and us telling the type of client that we like uh, to work with or that we feel that we can really gain traction and benefit with. And they tend to be... Um, you know, either professionals or families within either the, the broader area that tend to to want to um, build their own asset base and are seeking and value the benefits of, of quality advice. We also having um, having had advisors that have gone through the, the provisional year journey um, are also there to sort of access that more mass affluent base or the wealth accumulator base where coming in maybe perhaps off the back of a, uh, a mortgage broker or an accountant recognizing a need that that client has uh, so for some financial planning advice. And then we've also got that the advisor there to be able to take them through that journey. So it is very much mirroring, uh, if I look at your, 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 your About Us on your website, you've got the, the span from people in their early 20s to their early 60s. So your clients are mirroring that, that evolution. Um, but this is an engine room podcast, and and what what's happened is that it's been very difficult difficult for for businesses to service wealth accumulators yeah. um, because of the cost of goods. Maybe take us through sort of what what your your CSOs and the balance of your team do because we really need to make sure it's a finer margin with the with the mm. wealth accumulators. So, how, effectively, if I'm an advisor, I need to be doing more volume in your business and. I just be interested in the bits that you get the other team members to do. Yeah. In terms of our pods, the uh, high net wealth and principal advisors have their own CSO and power planner. Right. And the uh, mass affluent advisors more so are able to do a lot of it on their own with a dedicated uh, power planner support staff that assist them. So in terms of being able to to sort of reduce the, 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 the cogs there, it's not having that additional support on a permanent basis for the mass affluent advisor. And was the decision to move into pods and to make some accountability? And my definition of accountability is the lead advisor is responsible for, you know, a cohort of revenue, mm -hmm. um, growth in that revenue, growth in the headcount. I mean, there's probably a bunch of metrics which I'd love to tease out of you. Mm -hmm. um, but was that is that a, a new a thing, or is that a, did your coach? Tell you to get into that kind of model. What was your what was your rationale between having an accountability line? Yeah, it, it did tie into me moving into management and knowing that we now need to un understand how everybody can be accountable uh, for each of their of their roles. So that accountability came with uh, creating those as effectively paddocks and saying, okay, this allows you to then run your own sub business within the greater the greater business and uh, aligning your goals and aspirations with the business's aspirations. And it was all part of that relinquishing control for me as well because you can't be all things. So allowing the advisors to feel that they are responsible and this is this is my keep, this is my paddock and I'm going to run it according to the broader values and ideas of the business. However, I know that I've got that autonomy within this 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 paddock to 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 run it a certain way and attract those those um, ideal clients that that work and complement this business structure. Oh, that sounds awesome, and um, and we probably don't know. I, I am actually from the country, so agricultural metaphors yeah, is something that I've been waiting to lean into <laughs> yeah. for a long time. Look, we're going to go paddock to play. We're not probably going to talk about abattoirs. It's yeah. PG version, but <laughs> yeah. but I do I do like the visual where, um, and look, that paddock can grow. You can have good fences. You can have efficient use. Mm -hmm. You can have good crop rotation. So you know, I really do like that that metaphor, and I'm I'm utterly gutted that there's more business coaches that are using that one there. Just as long as you don't use the drought, that'll 
will probably be. Yeah, uh, no. we, we call that the GFC. <laughs> so, um, so maybe get us. A, so you're giving us a feel for for that. How do you measure success operationally? So, what's what's a what's a reasonable way in which you, as the GM, because I. Can I take it as you're not actively seeing any of those clients anymore? You've- not anymore. Okay. So first question is how do you measure? And then I wanted you to rewind and tell me how you wean to the clients off you, to the new people. So two questions. So in terms of measuring success, uh, I lean on two different approaches. So we've got a general balance scorecard approach for performance with our advisors, but that's looking more long-term, so a 12-month trajectory. Um, but given that I've sort of fallen into uh, to, to management, Roxy, I dare say that in some ways it was to an advantage that I was able to sort of really read and understand, okay, well, what would work with us without having the biases of what had come before? So a lot of what I do apply is, okay, we've got a balanced scorecard for 12 months, so we still need a short-term approach to what success looks like. And I lean a lot on um, the, the sort of a Clen Blanchard approach, which um, he's got a book called The One Minute Manager, and it's all about – understanding and having uh, what he calls key result areas. And this is something that we work on on a short-term basis with everybody, not only the advisors, but also the CSOs, anyone that's in CBD advisory, they want to know and have a clear path to what success looks like. So for us, being able to have key result areas, and we call it a goal map, and effectively it's something that I go through on a quarterly basis with the team. And what we say is it's, it's applying the Pareto Principle to what you want to achieve. So we say, okay, if your key result areas, let's say that they are the 20% that you do that's going to deliver the 80% of your results. So the advisors know, okay, these are my KRAs. And what would be an example? So what you're not seeing, listeners, because we haven't got video, is <laughs> is, is the hands that I'm going to be. It's the excitement. You know, it's the excitement. excitement. <laughs> I, yeah, I do get quite passionate so, about it. So um, we're, we're yeah. non-verbal <laughs> stuff at the moment. But what would be, give me an example. Give me an, so give me an yep. example of, 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 what, what one of those um, Pareto things would be at the coalface on a daily basis? Okay, so for an advisor, we run fixed term service agreements. So we have 12-month contracts with all of our uh, advisor ongoing clients. Uh, so they would know that it's about the retention. So we're looking at that on a regular basis. So a key result area there is have you been able to retain and, and foster that relationship with your client for another 12 months? Uh, and they know exactly, well, what does success look like in that area? So it's measurable, it's specific, and they know how um, how to achieve that outcome. We usually give them three months time frames to say, okay, you need to have met the client by X date and been able to deliver the services required. So that would have been an example for an advisor. Perfect, perfect. And um, and the, the second part of the question was um, when you transitioned from your own retained clients to handing them over, because- you know, when we spoke off air, a lot of the CEOs um, of these businesses were advisors and and we don't get that many general managers who were advisors. So I'm very curious as to, you know, how you managed to get those clients and you've, 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 you've introduced them to someone else and how that felt for you and how it ended up. I think it happened naturally only because I would go on maternity leave. So I was forced into having somebody uh, have to take care of the client. Right. So the introduction had already commenced just due to the fact that, well, I'm going on maternity leave for X amount of months. This person's more than capable. Coming back, it was also, uh, I would take on some of those clients for a short term until, you know, really got traction in management, but they'd already been familiar with other people in the business. So it's really introducing the other advisors and endorsing them, like being their advocate and saying, okay, you know, Elise would be fantastic at this. Nick would be great at this. Uh, or Max would be able to assist you with this. So the clients were then already under having had the experience with those with those advisors. They're like, yep, I've already spoken to that 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 advisor. No, no problem. And was it child one, two, or three that you realised that everyone else does a pretty good job in financial planning, <laughs> and you now are liberated? I think it was quite early in the piece. I was able to see quite quite. Um, quite soon after having my first child and coming back in, that management was very important, particularly in a family business where sometimes it can be undervalued, the importance of really being able to um, invest in your people and invest in the advisor's performance. Perfect, perfect. Now, um, you, you did a shout out to your licensee earlier in the podcast, but maybe give us a feel for you know uh, who you license with and why and what you see sort of is your relationship with them. Yeah, so we're licensed with ASVW Financial Services. Um, their headquarters are based out in Melbourne, Victoria. And I find that um, it, it is 
a partnership in many ways. Like we, we're quite uh, interested in broadening our tech stack. Um, we are heavily invested in um, Xplan and, and our version's Compass. So, you know, wanting and being quite passionate about being able to enhance that client experience, working with a licensee that understand that and say, okay, well, we're on this together. We're trying to work out ways to facilitate that or broaden that, but within the confines of what we obviously have to work with is is quite empowering, I find, because they understand. Like when I call up and say, look, this is what I'm looking at doing. What are your thoughts? I met with that reciprocated enthusiasm to say, okay, look, we'll see how we can make this work with you or R- for you. Rather than your call is important to us. But your call is important. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Press two. Um, so, well, that's a collaborative approach and that, that sort of segues into my next question, which is, sort of um, how you arrange your, your tech stack. You've intimated you've got the Compass version of X-Plan, mm. and, um, but, but what's the rest of the tech stack? So, as I said, heavily reliant on our processes. We've got um, quite a bit in threads and tasks in X-Plan, which is really the, the main core of our business. Um, you know, read the e-myth many years ago and just went crazy on threads and tasks. So, the whole business is process-based. Um, you can just literally pick it up. And that's why the paddocks worked well because it's just copy-paste, copy-paste, so to speak, in terms of processes. Everyone knows their role. They can assign their tasks. So we are quite heavy as a, as, as Compass or x as our CRM. Uh, we also um, use uh, the likes of um, for our communications Microsoft Sweep. So Teams is our way of It's got good, hasn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm – yeah. I'm, uh, uh, Color my businesses are on Microsoft, and um, uh, I just think that um, you know. Sorry to cut you off, but I just think that the MS Teams and all the rest of it are, are starting to take them out. And um, to be honest, well, we're at the point that uh, I was just questioning the other day, keeping all of our Zoom accounts. So well, we're doing everything on Teams a lot of the time now with client calls as well. So it's interesting just seeing this transition towards more of a, of a leaning towards our Microsoft suite. Um, so a lot of our communication is via Teams, particularly if we we have people working from home that works quite well for us. Um, we do do surveys and the likes through um, Typeform. We do internal surveys as well as external for clients, so we oh, do use that. We'll get to that later. So internals like invo- employee value stuff. Yes. Okay. Well, cool. Can't wait to talk about people mm-hmm. and culture and the external ones, Net Promoter and things like that. Great. Uh, we also use um, the Monday app just in terms of being able to track. Uh, internal success as well for the business. What we are looking for more is about as a client engagement tool. So we are uh, sort of currently researching. We have had some in the past. Who's on your short list? They're probably listening. <laughs> yeah. um, we are looking at a few, the likes of Astute Will, Dash, Lumion are probably our top contenders at the moment. Um, the frustrations that we do have, and I don't know if this sort of resonates with anyone else out there, is just that integration with X Plan, which I think is something that a lot of people feel, a lot of different practices feel. <sighs> Look, <laughs> Iris and, and and the other three just spend more money. Yeah. You know, as long as the advisors don't, um, then 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 jump on that. But you're right; it's 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 the the old adage of that integration, and um, you know, at some stage, one or more, many of them will get it right, um, and. You, do you say when you say customer engagement, does that intimate that you guys um, you're managing existing clients, but you're actively looking for new business as well? What what percentage growth are you hoping for, for on a client number per end? Yeah, look, a, a I mean a twenty percent growth would be fantastic. Giddy up, that would be amazing. Uh, so we do have inbuilt um, part of those key result areas, particular number of client acquisition per advisor. Uh, and really facilitating and cultivating those centers of influence that they have. Uh, part of that is also giving our advisors that autonomy and, and, and a budget to say, okay, you want to do a, um, a lunch and learn, you want to, to be so invest in your own centers of influence, here's sort of the budget spend to do so and really encouraging them to to take part in that. Well, that's that accountability. So you, you run them as quasi p and you, you make them business people. That's right. And, and um, you know, uh, I was going to say spoon fed, but um, you know we could do feed lot. I'm not sure we're doing the agricultural ones, so it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, um, that would be that would be my thoughts. Now, earlier on in the podcast, you mentioned that you're you're, you're in a panel, but but in relation to your business, do you have a um, do you have any outside influence? Do you have an client advisory board? Do you have anything like that that we, you've, you're seeking outside sort of influence on your business at this stage? Yeah, we were only discussing this recently. I- 
To date, we don't. Oh, we have key people that we do discuss, but we don't. The board at the moment consists of more senior management and and the key stakeholders. And board's a funny word, right? So, you know, board members per se, you know, they're all about risk and governance. You know, if you do the pure play, but I, I, was, I suppose that the evolution of an advisory board really isn't a board; it's just advisory people. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that would be uh, something that I'm seeing a fair bit. Um, and it's okay to learn off other practices. Mm. Because we're not really in competition, is, is my thoughts. Oh, most certainly. Uh, and, you know, being able to speak to some of the key practices out there and learn, you know, the whole adage of two ears, one mouth, use them accordingly. I like to listen as much as I can and obtain as, and new information from other businesses and other success stories. Absolutely. And when you're talking about obtaining information from, from other people, let's jump onto the people side of it. And the question I like to raise with, with uh, my guests are, um, you know, CBD advisory, why do people join you? Why do they stay and how do you grow with them? So maybe give me a bit of a feel for, you know, what you're looking for in, in people to join you as a start off and we'll kick into employee value proposition and all of these things that I know that you offer, I just want to articulate better. Okay. Well, if the hands were moving before, they'll move a lot now because this is probably the most passionate part of, of what I do day to day. <laughs> just keep tapping on the desk because the sound guy loves that. Um, why people join Uh, I think I learned through my own experience that being in a boutique financial planning firm you need to be very clear on the culture that you like to embrace when you've got a team of 10 working closely with people is is really important Um, and knowing that you can all get along profession in a professional environment is key so setting that expectations with our our team as well as any uh, future potential members is really, really important. I do notice a lot of times in my own experience that um, the corporate adult side and the boutique side are very different and I like to be quite transparent with people up front on how we run. So having a clear culture and vision of what that looks like, I think is imperative, particularly I find in, a, in the boutique space. So you're definitely, so when you, when you referenced the, the, the corporate versus the boutique, you did that to make an inference that you're more boutique and you're more family, you're more- Correct. So you mentioned that you're working closely together. Uh, are you all on one side? Yeah, we are all on one side. We, as in the team on shore, we're all on side um, in, uh, in Bodai Junction. And then we do have a team that, um, that's external as well that we outsource. But the, the team that's on site, yeah, we all work closely in the one headquarters. And um, the culture that we do facilitate is one that everybody understands what, what it is that we're about. So I recently did a uh, employee feedback form. And the one thing we asked was, how would you summarize the, the, the culture and the vibe, so to speak, at CBD Advisory? Cool. And almost you know, nine out of 10, or or in fact, probably all 10 in their own variant said the same sort of thing, which was, you know, casual yet professional family vibe. And really honing in on that, that, you know, we've got our our EVP being like, join us as family, um, but, you know, uh, develop and prosper uh, on your own as well through that autonomy. So it's being able to join as a collective, family collective, um, having that mutual respect and understanding, but then really cultivate and have that autonomy to build your own career. And we kind of build that on a three three core values that we have at our business, um, which are communication, collaboration, and empowerment. And I mean, I can I sort of expand on those three because I see them as the three pillars of what really reflects our culture. Well, and- the first one's communication, so go for it. <laughs> So communication, it's sort of applying the, the Kim, Kim Blanchard approach that I mentioned before. So it's having clear goals, uh, which is those key result areas that I mentioned. So short-term, succinct goals that aren't wishy-washy and then having the overall bro- uh, balanced scorecard approach. I think that's the best term I've heard, art wishy-washy. I think that, you know, there's criticism around, um, you know, junior people coming into organizations and not jumping straight on to learning exactly what you want. But if you hold a mirror up, if you don't give them clear sort of objectives and, 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 and goals, then and how do we expect them to get there? They can't read our minds. Well, yeah, they don't know what success looks like. So having that roadmap, that pathway to success is, is critical. And that's that communication piece. Having timely praise is very important. You know, really praising. Great point, quick Angie, you- great point. There's my timely praise for you. <laughs> Having timely praise and um, properly addressing conflicts and resolving 
is I found very important. I don't the old the old adage of don't go to bed on an argument, so to speak, but really applying that in business, like what's going on here, how to resolve that. So that's sort of the communication piece of which is one of those three pillars for us. Um, in terms of collaboration, I like to apply the a win win mindset. You know, it's they they say that uh, I think Stephen R. Covey, if anyone's read um, Seven Strategies of Highly Effective People, it's it's that notion of belief in that third alternative. You know, it's not my way, it's not your way, but it's the better way. And really applying that with our team and, and in business in gen- general, I find has worked really well for us. And it does sort of give our, it empowers our staff to know that, well, I'm respected. It almost, it cultivates that mutual respect. Well, they're going to listen to me and it's not, I don't feel like I'm, I'm you know, be, somehow being um, outdone here or, or, or not, not, not getting getting the short end of the stick. It's a long way from command and control management. That's right. Collaborative management. Yeah. And and I guess in in that is also being true to the word. You know, I had a a senior advisor and we were just having one of our midpoint uh, check-ins recently. He said, you know, you've been true to your word since day one. And that was really important for me, the fact that you've been true to your word. And I I take that quite quite seriously and and really appreciated that comment. So collaboration would be our, our second pillar. And then lastly is empowerment, which kind of went back to the paddock system that we do have. So I've got this saying, which is um, empowerment breeds excellence through autonomy and responsibility. And basically what that really means to us is that when you have empowered staff or empowered colleagues, then they feel that they have that autonomy to go ahead and, and do things on their own accord. And it really makes them feel that they have purpose. So we've got a, a, a client service officer, her name is Sonia, and she's been with us for seven plus years. And um, she, she'd be at the point where she's collating some information for a client and we've got an elderly client who doesn't like email, you know, anti, anti the digital age and with, with all due respect, you can understand that that's a bit complicated and overbearing for him. And, you know, we'd come back, she's like, yep, I just dropped that off. She lives around the corner from where this gentleman lives. Well, you know, she may be having a tea with him, hearing something about his life story, and she comes to work feeling so fulfilled because she's like, "Yep, not a problem. I've helped him, helped him with his TV, and gave him the forms that he needed. Um, you know, that otherwise would have been sent in the mail and handled in a way." So and that's she- that autonomy and responsibility. That's so, right. So Sonia did that um, and informed you afterwards, I imagine. Yes, on her own accord. You know, she knows that. Well, but it's it, it's all breeding that excellence because what a great customer outcome being able to provide that client with that experience where she's come out of her way, dropped it off to me, helped me with my TV, which was just a nice little help there. But it was that ability to have that really friendly and um, personalized service. So we can um, add the links that uh, Sonia provides a uh, great, <laughs> yeah. great, She'll be able great to- <laughs> IT service for the clients uh, as well. And, and maybe um, a, a, a bit more empowerment, potentially sort of that's all about how you're mentioning that you're enabling them to be empowered, but as an emerging and actual leader in the business, how do you empower yourself and, and what leadership kind of um, provisions do you give to yourself? Yeah, so it's really being um, being aware of what goals I set for myself, which, which is pretty much the broader business. And that's where I do have external people to hold me accountable and uh, be able to show me what that path is going to look like. Because I do invest a lot of my time focusing on the team. Others, yep. Others. And um, sometimes without those external partners, that would probably be an area that falls to the to the wayside if I'm not having somebody holding me accountable. So just as a, as a piece of advice for other practice and general managers, so you've got, a, is it a coach or a friend or a mentor? Or, and what's the regularity of that that check-in for you? Yeah, so I, I have worked with a coach and that's usually on a monthly basis where we're able to just sit down and, and reflect on what our, um, our 12 months up to five-year trajectory looks like, but then work on our short-term goals. And um, what's that sort of, tenure of your business you know you sound like a, a very much a family business there and and if i'm a if i'm a, a person who's who's coming into work for you effectively and i'm in my 20s or 30s it must be quite refreshing and rewarding to see that you know you can have a family and work in this business there is no sort of inbuilt bias in fact it's probably embraced so do you get a lot of longer term tenured people in your business yeah uh we have uh, to date like we've got people that have been with us for almost 10 years uh, at the moment. So, yeah, we do have, I think, a lot of our 
our team do do stick when they feel that they do feel comfortable with the culture uh, and the vision of the business. And we spoke earlier about um, you mentioned about the your global team, and obviously I I'm aware of that. We 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 caught up um, uh, recently with some of your team members for a pretty fun time in in the Philippines. Um, in relation to communication, collaboration, and empowerment, do you? Have any different ways in which you deal with your global back office team or is it the same? I'm really interested because as a person who has a bit of oversight, you, you, you tend to do pretty well with them even compared to other clients. Yeah, so we, we embarked on the journey of outsourcing our power planning about three years ago. And since doing so, we've still got pretty much the, the same team that we started with and expanded that slightly more with adding an additional uh, power planner on, on board. So we do utilize our virtual business partners as our um, uh, outsourcing partner for power planning service. Now, I found that that relationship has worked really well with our power planners. But, but it takes two to tango. That's right. right? Because yes. even VVP that I know well has a 15% attrition rate or 10 to 15, whatever it is. So I'm just really interested in the, the things that you're cooking in Bondi Junction in, in Sydney how are you making sure that they feel part of it? Because there's a bit of magic in that, end. Yeah. So, I look, I replicate as much as I can. Those same three pillars apply to the power planners. So, communication, we have daily huddles. Usually, our office manager will do those. We've got a an SOA pipeline, which we're mapping on how things are working for them. They work, they generally tend to work uh, for one advisor, which co- that creates that clear vision of responsibility and line of communication. That we found that that um, model has worked best for us. So then we're able to see where they were at with each case that they're working on. And they do have uh, X plans, so they're able to see what part of the thread or task they're at. So we do one on ones with them um, each day. And then we also have quarterly uh, reviews with them. So using that key result area approach, they also have key result areas. So they really have an idea of what success looks like. And that sort of complements um, their their benchmark approach that they have with virtual business partners as well. And then we have a bonus structure that we apply with them on a regular basis. So it's keeping them is that, accountable. Is that, that's tethered to an outcome? Tethered to an outcome based on those key result areas. So it's not wishy-washy. It's not wishy-washy. Okay, good. That was, I suppose, that I, I, um, and when you do achieve all these things, um, how do you celebrate it? What does, what does fun and celebration look like in your business? Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I think it's quite fun, but we we do have – we've got short-term uh, rewards. So we have a uh, the month that was each month, and that's an opportunity for us to present uh, to each, to the whole team, where we're going, uh, how things have been tracking for the month. We celebrate some wins. We celebrate we, – we discuss challenges. And then we also provide um, a quarterly reward system, and that's based on looking at a few different metrics. So whichever pod sort of came out on top that month. I say competitive tension. Well, collaboration, but well, a little bit of fun. I don't know, I'm there. big on it. I'm yeah. big on it. Like, like that's fun as well, right? Yeah, and look, we we like to break bread a lot. So there'll be a lunches. Um, we'd go out and just celebrate a win for the specific pod that won. Each time we do the monthly catch up, it's over lunch or over a brunch. Um, and it's an opportunity to present everyone's successes for the for the month. Uh, so, and we also have an above and beyond nomination. So that again sort of ties in with the empowerment, where everyone nominates somebody that they felt went above and beyond for the month, and then they'll get like a half day half day off just as a thank you gesture to celebrate the fact that they did they were really a key player for that month. So that's part of the wins. We also do a lot of team activity. So we'll have say two. Client uh, to um, staff uh, activity days where we might do something to sort of have team bonding as well as to social events. Um, and then we also would do our midpoint check ins. So, again, going back to what success looks like, I tend to take each staff member out to, for lunch at the mid. So, we just finished it already just now for their midpoint, the mid-point check in. quarter, is that right? No, so this would be over the year. Okay. Uh, so we do the monthly lunches. There's a lot of lunches for you. There, there are a lot of lunches, <laughs> yeah. But I hope it doesn't go to the waste. But no, there are a fair few. But we also will do a mid-year check-in got with it. the in-house team. And um, so I, I, have you got yeah, the quarterly pod winners? There's some, and when, like, I'm going to come back and ask you sort of, uh, you've given in what you are. I'd be interested in sort of the people 
who you're looking to attract because you've built a business with 10 people that's very scalable, okay? So it's very scalable um, and it'd be wonderful maybe to get a feel for, you know, what your vision of, of your business is because you've got if you've got three pods, you can have 10. If you've got this working, uh, you know, you've got your, your, your global team humming along, you've, you've tethered that to actual productivity, you've humanized that by a site visit, you've got Microsoft Teams humming, you have a platform to scale. What is your vision for the, the future of, of your business um, over the short, medium and long term? Yeah, I think we're at we're at that unique point at the moment where the business is is ready to be able to grow. Uh, we've got our processes, like you said, in place. So, being able to uh, attract new talent and replicate the paddocks would be something that we're most certainly looking at over the next five years, and really building upon the the system that we find is working really well and replicating that. Historically, how have you how have you recruited people? Uh, we have used recruiters in the past, so I've found great success for a profusion group, uh, have been great, and uh, I do like the Striver platform, which is headed up by Alastair Barr for um, graduates. I find that they give you great understanding of the psych testing, psychometric testing for each candidate. You are meeting some eager uh, university uh, students that really want to get an understanding of the financial services industry, so a lot of our associates had come through that path in the past um, and also just our broader community, just always sort of having that discussion. We well, are open business. You. Yeah. So I'll put in a shameless plug for the Ensemble platform here. Um, and, and Ensemble. If you're, a, um, if you're a person who's jumped into a business in your professional year or you're a, a practice owner, um, there's a whole uh, sort of community based around PY, I think, um, mm. which has been graciously supported by CFS. Um, that has a lot of resources. So, it, 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 it first of all, it helps the the individual, but also it helps the the small to medium sized business with a bit of the heavy lifting. So, you know, making sure you're jumping in there. Yeah, I actually was. I jumped on recently after the um, having seen Emily's uh, presentation actually, and it was it was great to see that access. So that would most certainly be something when we are looking at acquiring that I'd look at again. Awesome, awesome. And um, your your I suppose the question is um. You're in Sydney, you do have a lot of face-to-face, -face, but are you a hybrid work offering? If I was to, let's say, for instance, I went, I like what you're cooking, um, I, I want to work for you, um, What what's the proposition as far as how do you engage people? We do work off a hybrid model. So generally, it's three days in the office to uh, working from home uh, with, with the option to work from home two days. Yep. Uh, we do like everyone in the office on Mondays and Fridays. Reason being is that on Mondays we have our, our pod meetings. So everybody has to be in or generally like to be in to be able to discuss where we're going for the week. And then Fridays is effectively our reflection. Where have we gone and where are we sort of planning to go? Uh, and what do we need ready for Monday's uh, meeting? Uh, so we do work on a hybrid model and that seems to be working well, giving that flexibility to, to our team. Well, you've got that collaboration point on the Mondays and Fridays. Uh, it enables a closer communication. You've got the daily huddles, but then you empower them from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to choose their own adventure. Yeah. And I imagine some choose to work in the office, some go and see clients, some will work from home if they've got a you know a deep work log as well. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, in relation to the uh, business um, ownership, um, you say it's a family business. Um, does that mean it's always going to be a family business or is there, you know, is, is there a kind of an incentive for people coming through to potentially get a piece of the action, so to speak, in the future? Oh, most certainly. We're, we're in discussions about that at the moment, um, looking at, at a structure for an employee share um, plan. So that's most certainly something that we'd be doing. Because um, it, it can be complicated or, or it can't be. It's, um, um, and it, it's part of... Part of what attracts people, you know, quite often people want to, they buy people, okay? They buy where you're at in the market. They buy the tools that you've got. They buy of other things. Um, I, you know, we chatted earlier, you, you do charitable stuff. You've got world vision. You've done that. So, so you know, you, you're ticking that limbic box of you are good people. You've got the family thing. Um, and I just think that to, to retain people long term, that blue sky of you're going to be part of something bigger is, is possibly, you know, a solution. Um, yeah, most certainly. And the, the feedback we get from our current advisors is, I feel that my my word has weight. 
And that's really important that when they do have an idea, and that's all part of that collaboration piece, which is one of those pillars is, yes, we do value what you say, and we want you to be part of the future direction of this business. And that does come with tenure, of course, and knowing the people that you feel comfortable that you could work with. So I think our, particularly our advisors and the broader team do feel empowered that they are heard and um, that what they do say is going to be at least taken into consideration and potentially a lot of times implemented. Now, that's got a lot to do with you. That's got a lot to do with the way in which you position yourself, the way in which you you carry yourself. Uh, This business CBD advisory, um, you're quite young, you know, um, so it's something that that you're looking to drive for the next 10 years plus. Would that be right? Yes. Because if I'm by, if I'm if I'm a potential person listening to this and I, and I think, well, that's good, I need to get a feel for, for that. And also, you know, one day you're going to have to replace yourself in this role as well and, 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 you know, figuring out what you're good at, what you're not, which I imagine your coach will tell you, will uh, give you those insights will work. Now, um, have you ever acquired businesses or has it been all organic? Yes, we have. Uh, it has been organic and we acquired a business uh, a few years ago. And that sort of brought on another advisor as well. Um, and we would be looking to do so again in, in the future um, if the right sort of practice came up and we did all of our due diligence, which I think is very prevalent to make sure that we're aligned with the business that we would like to acquire. Uh, but we have acquired in the past. But most of the of the, the growth has been uh, organic growth. Well, we're here and we're live. What's a right practice look like? Uh, the, well, I think having similar systems to us, like obviously having processes that are really How well tuned, is important. Most people lead with people and revenue and whatnot, but you've you've, you've actually come in at it really sophisticated. So go on. Yeah, I find that um, when clients understand or really appreciate the fact, like being on a fixed terms service arrangements, they really know, like every nine months at a minimum, depending on what service level they're at, they're going to get that call and knowing that our our people understand what those processes look like and that understand the expectations that are, are involved in those. That's really important. Um, obviously, looking at um, the type of advice that's been given. So just to reiterate, the reason that I find processes really important is that it also sets that expectation for any additional team members that may come across to understand that they understand the importance of that. Whilst they're going to be tweaked, of course, it's sort of be embedded into our business. It is great when you know that um, there's that level of understanding on this is this sort of business as usual, so to speak. So that would be somewhat important to us, as well as the people coming across is obviously quite critical. Um, to see if we've got that culture uh, understanding or that same level of of, of understanding with those um, potential uh, key members that may come on board. And you're definitely looking for businesses, not just just client books uh, uh, per se. I believe so. Yeah, I think that would be the way that we'd go down. And what you're building, and I hope this has come through, and I'm sure it has, is that you're building a really good platform. Um, So there are a lot of other operators out here who have tried to do both and and come to the realisation they just love talking with clients. So, um, you know, not Robinson Crusoe in saying that. And, and you know, if, if you fall into that boat, you've got, you've got a couple of options. You can either get together with a bunch of other people like that and then hire and build the thing that you've built the last 10 years. You can go to a really big organization, a bit like Goldilocks, isn't it? Or you can get something just right that sort of fulfills you and your, your life stage, which is, I imagine, what you're putting out there as far as, you know, where we're very interested in you integrating into our business. We've got the systems, we've got you. Um, and bring across your, your great opportunities, but your, your media ones and even your tough ones, and we'll work with you to to you know make it more efficient, and smooth. Yeah, that's right. And the fact that we have that framework, but to, from a management perspective as well, to to empower each of those individuals that would be coming into the business, I think that that's that's something that could be quite attractive to other businesses to be able to plug into. Yeah, look, and we'll chuck something on the talent hub. I think they're curing the sound guy. So um, now um. In relation to practice managers and general managers in the industry, um, you've got a great position in the industry and you've, 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 your business has been going 30 years. And in reality, 20 years ago, they, they, this role didn't exist. But what advice would you be giving to people looking either inside a financial planning practice or outside wanting to get into running a, a, a planning business? And where do you see that role going in, in the future in financial planning? The, the advice that I would give somebody looking to embark on on a more of a general management, practice management role is um, 
really starting to understand the mechanics of how businesses work. I think that the roles really, at least from my perspective, is moving into uh, more broadly understanding working on the business. So getting coaching. Getting coaching is yep. really important to that because you've got that to have that growth mindset. It's one thing I think having management, but understanding that you need to have a growth mindset to sort of propel forward is I think really key to being in this role, at least yep. from that's been my perspective and experience. And having coaches, having mentors, great people around you that can, can really excel and propel you forward would be great. Like the advice that I would give somebody. Sounds like it uh, might fall into the following three categories, communication, <laughs> collaboration, and empowerment. That's right. <laughs> Look, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I've watched your business from afar. You're, you're really warm. Um, uh, uh, the uh, What's lost in a podcast is just the amount of uh, uh, hand movements and gestures <laughs> um, that, that come from that. I know that people who know you um, um, really love working with you and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the engine room and on behalf of the aspirational general managers and practice managers in Australia for your time today. Thanks very much. Thanks Rox, it was a pleasure.